Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about wings and specifically, why are they flexing as much as they do? How much can they actually flex? How are they constructed? And is there anything that could make them break? Stay tuned. This video is brought to you in cooperation with Skillshare. Now, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of high quality courses in pretty much anything. Yes, anything that you can think about. The first 500 of you guys who uses this link here below will get two months absolutely for free. And I do really, really recommend that you go in and check some of the courses out. Right guys, so today we're going to be talking about wings and you've probably seen this yourself if you've been sitting by a window uh, seat on an aircraft and you've been looking out to the wing and you've been looking at the wing, especially if there's a little bit of turbulence, you would probably have seen that the wings are kind of flexing up and down. And I know that this is something that makes a lot of passengers nervous, especially if you are a little bit afraid of flying to start with or you're a little bit of a nervous flyer. So today I'm going to be explaining what it is that you're actually seeing. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about how the wings are constructed. Now, as you probably know by now, the wings are the part of the aircraft that is creating the lift to hold the aircraft up in the air. So this means that the entire weight of the aircraft needs to be able to be held by the wings. And in the case of a Boeing 747 or an Airbus 380, that's going to be hundreds of tons. And not only that, it's hundreds of tons on top of the fact that it will actually be subjected to G-forces as well. So it's actually more than the weight of the aircraft that the wings have to be holding. So this will lead you to believe that the wings are extremely sturdy. They're extremely well built. Okay, The wings and the wing box, which is the connecting point of the wing under the aircraft, is probably the most sturdy part of the entire aircraft. Okay. The way that they are constructed is that you tend to have two parallel wing um, spars. These are the bulks that are going from the wing tip all the way across the length of the uh, wing into where they're connecting to the aircraft. So the two of those generally could be more. And between those spars, you have what's called ribs. Uh, these are elements that goes and and shapes the wing, that actually forms the shape of the wing and that connects the skin of the wing to the uh, the spars. So the forces, the aerodynamic forces of the the wing is getting taken up by the skin, which tends to be made out of aluminium. I'll get to that in a second. And then it's transferred through the ribs onto the spars. This construction where all of these parts are kind of sharing the loads slightly, is extremely durable. And not only that, it's also very lightweight, which is crucial when you're constructing an aircraft. So I mentioned before that it's made out of aluminium. But when you hear aluminium, I bet that you think about, you know, aluminium cans, like a Coca-Cola can or something like that. But this is something completely different. It is aluminium, but it's an aluminium alloy, which is extremely hard and durable. It's called it's um, aviation grade aluminium. The other benefit that you'll have by using that construction with spars and ribs is that a large portion of the wing is going to be empty. So this means that we can put fuel inside of the wing. Now, I've already done an episode about why we put fuel in the wings. You can check it out here. It's really, really informative, guys. I I, I really uh, want you to check that out. But one of the reasons that we put fuel in the wings is because it acts as a counterweight to the rest of the weight inside of the aircraft. That way, if we put fuel tanks in the wings, it means that instead of having all of the weight concentrated in the middle where the aircraft, sorry, where the wings meet the aircraft. Now, since the fuel is out there, the, the um, weight is going to be more evenly distributed and that will actually help the wings from uh, bending too much or from flexing too much. Okay, cool. So I mentioned before that the wings are connected to the aircraft via a wing box. Now the wing box is situated just in front of the main wheel well bay and it is 
pretty much a elongation of the wings. So you have spars inside of there as well and you have something similar to ribs. It is once again very very sturdy. It is the part of the aircraft which is best built. So it's connected. The wings are connected to the wing box via hundreds of bolts and it's the way that it is connected and interconnected into each other makes it pretty much a one whole piece. So when you think about uh, the wings connected to the aircraft, you should be thinking the other way around. It's actually the aircraft that is connected to the wings, not the other way around. That's how to think about it. So what about the flexing then? Well, the flexing of the wing, when you look out, if you're a little bit nervous and you look out and you see the wings are flexing like that, what you should be thinking is, this is a healthy construction. Because what you're seeing is the loads of the wing being shared by all the individual components. So when a wing is flexing, it means that there is not a single point that is being subjected to all of the forces, but the forces are being equally distributed out of the wings. So if the wings would be completely uh, stiff, okay, if they wouldn't have any flex in them, it means that all of the forces that are being subjected onto the wings would be concentrated to a few points. And that might be, for example, the points where the wings are connected to the wing box or something else. And it's much more likely, if you have something like that, that those parts will be subjected to metal fatigue and that's where the wing is going to break. So next time that you look out of the wing and you see it's flexing, you should be thinking, ah, it's working. That's the way it's supposed to look. The wings will be flexing different amount, okay? You are most likely to see a lot of wing flexing during takeoff um, because that's when the aircraft is heaviest, that's when we have the most fuel on board uh, and that's also when we are taking out the most amount of lift. So as we are pulling back during the takeoff, all of the lift needed to lift the aircraft off the ground is going to be subjected to the wings and you might see them kind of bend upwards. It's very, very common to see it uh, in an almost extreme amount on like the uh, Boeing 787 Dreamliner or the Airbus 350. Um, you will also see it flexing during turbulence. So this leads us to ask, what kind of limits do we have? There are different limits of different types of aircraft, but air transport category aircrafts like the 737 or the Airbus 320, uh, they, are, they have G limits that range from minus 1G to plus 2.5G. Okay, that's where we should be keeping if we are under normal circumstances as we're turning or if we are subjected to um, up to moderate uh, turbulence. But the aircraft manufacturers, when they actually build the aircraft, they will subject the wings and the structure to much, much more stress than that. So there are huge security margins built into it. Now, I should be mentioning as well, when I'm talking about G-forces, what G-forces actually are. If you're sitting like I am now, sitting in the sofa, you are subjecting 1G onto the sofa. Your weight is 1G. So minus 1G, if I was subjected to minus 1G, it would mean that I would fly up into the roof, okay? That's the feeling you have, you know, when, you have, when you're in turbulence and you feel that kind of falling feeling where the, the stomach is coming up. That is slight minus G, but I can promise you that you've never felt minus 1G because that's a lot. Plus 2.5 Gs, that means 2.5 times your body weight being pressed down, so that's quite a lot. That is more than you will be subjected to during roller coasters, for example, normally. Um, so wing flexing, completely normal, and it's due to, um, to these things that I'm talking about. The, the differences you might see between different aircraft types is that, like for example, the 787 and the uh, Airbus 350, they have made their wings not from aluminium, but from composite materials. And the composite materials are actually more flexible than aluminium is. So those newer types of aircraft, you will see those wings flex way more than you will see on older type of wings. Also, you have to take into consideration the wingspan. If you are flying on a, a, a huge aircraft like a, a Boeing 747 or an Airbus 380, well, of course, there's going to be much more components in those wings. Each component bends a little bit or flexes a little bit. 
um, which means that a huge wingspan will look like, if you look out to the wingtip, like it's flexing more. So that, that will be considered completely normal as well. Now, other things that the, the wing bending actually does is it acts a little bit like a damper. So if you're flying on, uh, on one of these bigger aircraft, it's likely that you will feel turbulence a little bit less. That is both because of the damping force from the wing, but also because of the just bigger mass in those aircraft. So, what about what actually can cause an aircraft to break up? What can actually break the wings? Well, when we talk about this, um, there are, you know, circumstances in nature that could cause this. And that would be, for example, if we would fly our aircraft into a severe thunderstorm. So inside of a thunderstorm, there will be a lot of different air um, pillars going either up or down. There's going to be a lot of, of extreme turbulence. And if we would find ourselves inside one of those thunderstorms, like the ones that makes up the hurricanes in America, um, we could theoretically um, put the aircraft under more stress than it's designed to take. And that could potentially create... Um, breaks in the structure but i'm going to say this again it is not the wings you're going to see breaking there's going to be something else way before the wings break because they are extremely strong but we have weather radar to make sure that that doesn't happen we plan our flights so it doesn't happen we can see it outside of the window so flying into those types of extreme thunderstorms without noticing it it's very rare it almost never happens okay no the real challenge to the aircraft structure, the real thing that could make an aircraft actually break up in mid-flight is poor maintenance. That is really the only thing that we should be nervous about. Poor maintenance, uh, and what I mean by that is that the aircraft manufacturer have been given very clear maintenance schedules for each aircraft. The way this is done is that as an aircraft is being constructed, the aircraft manufacturer will subject all of the components, especially things like the wings, to testing. They will both physically test the wings by subjecting them to simulated cycles, as in simulated takeoffs and landings. But on top of that, they will also put it into the computer. So the, um, the, the engineers will know exactly what kind of metals are involved, what kind of components are involved. They have a computer model and then they start running that computer model just if, as if the aircraft was flying thousands of sectors. And they run the computer model until they start seeing where and which component is most likely to break. So let's say, for example, that they find that after 15,000 cycles, there's one component that starts to show signs of metal fatigue. Well, in that case, they will go out and they will tell the people who are buying the aircraft, the airlines, that, okay, at 10,000 sectors or 10,000 um, cycles, we need you to go in and we need you to do either non-destructive testing. Non-destructive testing is x-rays or ultrasounds of these uh, parts looking see if there's anything wrong with them or most likely they're just going to tell them to replace this individual component. It's not going to be the whole wing but it's going to be a part of it that might be either reinforced or replaced. So this has been done throughout the, um, the, the, the life of an aircraft. You do checks on a very regular intervals and on um, fairly regular intervals you have these larger checks where you actually have to go in and x-ray and check all of the different components that might be subject to metal fatigue. You also have something called the uh, fleet leader and that's the first aircraft that has been brought into service of a specific type. That fleet leader is being subjected to extra checks because it's going to be kind of the the mother ship, the one that you can see, all right, so here is how it's actually working outside of the computer in the real world, how it is actually progressing and if it finds if the if Boeing, for example, finds something with one of the fleet leaders, well then that is going to go out to all of the different um, airlines that have bought this specific type and say, okay, check for this. 
This is why you see, for example, when something does happen, that immediately there is a message sent out to everyone who's operating that particular type to make sure that this component is working properly. So this means that only airlines that are not following these guidance from the manufacturer are the ones that stand the risk to you know, fatigue, metal fatigue their aircraft, where you might actually get into a catastrophic failure. And the obvious question after that would be, well, how do I avoid flying with airlines like that? Well, it, it, that this is actually very, very simple. What you do is you fly on any airline that is allowed to fly, for example, in the European Union or in the United States. Because the way that this is checked is that the civil aviation authorities are obviously making sure and doing inspections on all airlines to make sure that they're following all the different maintenance steps. If an airline is found not to follow the maintenance steps and not to have the proper security and safety um, measures in force, well then they will put, be put on something called the blacklist and the different CAAs have these blacklists. So some airlines might not be allowed to enter the airspace of, for example, Europe or US. And of course, an airline who is not allowed to enter that, uh, that is an airline that you should be careful with. But any other airline that is allowed to fly within these airspaces, you can be absolutely sure that they are being checked and held to the absolute highest standard. So there's no point of being worried about them. Guys, if you have more questions about this, if you have more questions about how an aircraft is constructed or why it looks in a specific way, then please put in a comment here below. And also, if you want to ask me directly, right now, for example, then you just get my free app, Mentor Aviation. There are links to it down here. And you go into the chat and you put at Mentor, what is this? And I will get a message onto my phone and I can talk to you directly. There's also videos in there that I think that you should be watching. Um, you know, different YouTube videos that I recommend and things like that. And also courses on how to set up the 737 from dark until it's ready to taxi. Or how to do a rejected takeoff and an evacuation. So check that out. Before we go, I want to send a special thank you to Skillshare who made this video possible. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of high quality courses in pretty much anything that you can imagine. The way that I use Skillshare myself is I go in if there's something that I want to improve on or I want to learn. For example, if I want to learn how to paint, I love painting, and uh, or improve on my Spanish skills or indeed how to start a YouTube channel. Well, I just go into Skillshare, I log in, I write in what it is that I'm looking for and voila, there will be like 10 or 15 different courses from really good instructors. And believe me, I know when I see a good instructor. Um, and they will teach me in a very pedagogical way how to improve on whatever skill it is that I want to improve. So the 501st of you guys who uses this link here below will get two months of the premium feature of Skillshare absolutely for free. So there's no risk involved. Just go in and check it out. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. 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 Bye.